To the left hand side for Vieira. He'll play it through to Gabriel Jesus, who's in here for Arsenal. Gabriel Jesus to finish it off. Oh, what a way to do it! Gabriel Jesus seals the points for Arsenal. He's back and he's back with a bang. Into the penalty area it goes. Gabriel Keller and it's into the back of the net. Arsenal take an early lead through Gabriel. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the daily Arsenal podcast with me, Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, how's it going? Hope you're all good. Hope you're all well. Welcome back to another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast with me, your host, Harry Simiou. Coming to you on this Sunday morning, um, still pretty sad, still pretty upset by the news that we received yesterday, um, the sad passing of Kevin Campbell. Uh, It came to light yesterday and we uh, dedicated an episode yesterday um, to my friend Kevin Campbell. I'm really proud to be able to say that um, incredible man. And look, we're we're going to talk some Arsenal news today, but I did want to start off by saying, like, although yesterday was a really really sad day, and Kevin Campbell will be missed by so many reading the kind of outpouring of love for the guy was really kind of helpful to me, I think, in processing this. And I think that a lot of people will agree. The most interesting thing about Kevin Campbell is that he had a a wonderful football career. But that's not what people are talking about. People are talking about the man. People are talking about his character. And it's a testament to how special he was that that shines through and trumps what he did as a footballer. There are loads of great footballers over the years. And, you know, I've had the fortune or misfortune, depending on how you look at it, of meeting some of them and working with some of them who were nowhere near as nice as Kevin Campbell. It's not a competition who's nicer than who, but the fact that we've all come away from this talking about the man and talking about what an incredible person he was, it's just incredible. I read a a saying that someone posted yesterday um, it, it's one thing to be good at what you do, but to be good to everyone and good at what you do is just incredible. And that's that's what you would say about Kevin Campbell. Um, there's been some amazing tributes online. When I got home last night, I sort of laid in bed for a good, probably an hour, scrolling through social media and reading lots and lots of them. And look, you're always going to get colleagues coming out and saying, you know, great to work with, et cetera, et cetera. But the the most telling thing for me was that there were so many fans, just regular fans that wouldn't have had the opportunity to work with Kevin Campbell, sharing their experiences of encounters they had with him, warm moments, the way that his kind of character and warmth came through. There was one video that really got me. It was a video of Kevin Campbell outside Goodison Park and the Everton fans kind of like mobbed him. You know, they wanted to take a picture. They wanted to say hello. It was all love, but like the way he kind of took that in his stride and sort of, you know, just, I I don't know, the way he kind of embraced everybody back was just amazing to see. And, you know, I'm not, not sitting here digging people out, but I've worked with footballers recently that, you know, couldn't be bothered to take a selfie with somebody who's a fan. And I think that kind of humbleness and that sort of being able to stay grounded when you're a footballer and relate to the people that ultimately have been turning up, paying tickets to watch you, etc., and have helped you along the way, to be able to repay that, I think is special. And I think a lot of people allow their ego to get in the way. And then that doesn't happen maybe as much as it should. Not Kevin Campbell. Um I'm obviously still incredibly sad. And if you haven't listened to our tribute to Kevin Campbell yesterday, um, you can go back and check it out. Um, I sort of pressed the record button maybe half an hour after I found out the news yesterday. So it was all a little bit raw, a little bit emotional, but um, I felt like I wanted to do it. And I'm glad I did now. And um, yeah, rest in peace, um, Kevin Campbell. Arsenal legend. And for me, more than that, um just a legend in general and i'm as i keep saying i'm i'm so grateful 
um, to be able to call Kevin Campbell a friend and to have known him and to um, have shared some experiences with him. And, you know, yeah, may he rest in peace, of course. Rest in peace, Kevin Campbell. Somebody else, unfortunately, very, very sadly, lost their life yesterday uh, in the footballing community. And that was the Millwall goalkeeper, uh, Mataya Sarkic, who passed away at the age of just 26. 26, man. Um, this is really, really sad stuff too. And I didn't know um, much about Mataya Sarkic before yesterday. I knew he got a fair few games for Millwall last season, was their number one goalkeeper. Um, for a while, obviously, working for BBC London, I'm kind of across what goes on there. But again, another person who's gone way too soon. And again, lots and lots of tributes being paid to him. Um, and uh, our best wishes go out, of course, to his family. Um, 26 years old, man. That's mad. Um, really, really sad news. So uh, rest in peace, Matthias Arkic. A difficult day for the football community yesterday. OK, let's move on uh, to some of our Arsenal related stories today. Uh, these are stories that came out not yesterday, the day before, really. Um, so you're talking Friday, uh, but we haven't had a chance to discuss them. We were planning to discuss them on Saturday's pod and then the news broke and it just didn't feel right to be sitting there talking about, um, you know, potential transfers. Um I thought it was best to pay tribute to the big man, and and that's that's what we did. But we did hear on Friday afternoon uh, that Reese Nelson has informed Arsenal that he wants to assess his options uh, for a potential transfer this summer. Arsenal, according to this report, rejected approaches in January and would want around about twenty million pounds, including add-ons, if they decide to sell. Number of clubs have been uh, reported as being interested: Crystal Palace. Fulham, Nottingham Forest and West Ham among the 24-year-old wingers suitors. And that is according to David Ornstein. Look, I think when it comes to Reese Nelson, I think it's probably fair to say that he's a lot more talented than we've been allowed to see at Arsenal. I think you've seen flashes, you've seen glimpses, you've seen his energy, you've seen the way he can buzz around the quick changes of direction, the tidy footwork, all of that stuff. That's what Reese Nelson is all about. He's a tricky wide man. And I think if he plays regularly, he will contribute goals and he will contribute assists and he can make a difference. But unfortunately for him at Arsenal, he's been too far down the peck in order to do that. And when he has had limited opportunities, has he grasped them? Probably not, but I'm always really reluctant to dig out players that get a game once in a blue moon and then when they do, don't have a good one because there's no rhythm there. There's no... Um, you know, there's no mileage there, really, if you you want to look at it that way in terms of being ready to go and, and sort of clearing the engine and being ready to really give your best when the stretch comes. It, I think I've always looked at him and thought, you're talented. But why hasn't it worked at Arsenal? I, I mean, it's difficult to say, isn't it? We know that he went on some loan spells, um, came back, obviously scored that massive goal in the 22-23 season against Bournemouth. And I wondered if that was going to be the liftoff moment for Reese Nelson's career. I've always said that I prefer Reese Nelson on the left to the right. Um, unfortunately for him, Arsenal have Gabriel Martinelli and they have Leandro Trossard, who you know has really stepped up uh, recently and, and provided some really, really important goals. So it was always going to be difficult for Reese Nelson to find a way into the team. He, he's too far down the pecking order. But as I say, that doesn't mean he can't be a good signing for those clubs. And you know what? I'm glad that there are a number of Premier League clubs that are looking at him because I really do think that if Reese Nelson played regularly at any of those clubs, he could be a really good asset. He's just 24 years old, which when you think about how long he's been around Arsenal, it is is quite astonishing, really, because if I go back to when he first kind of burst onto the scene and was being talked about as you know, a really exciting prospect at Arsenal. You know, that feels like a million miles ago. And and he's here now and he's at a point where I think for him, a bit like when I talk about Eddie and Ketia, the move is the right thing. And as difficult as it might be to give up the opportunity to represent a club like Arsenal. And I think that is the case for a lot of these footballers and particularly those who have come through the ranks and have that affiliation. 
I think it needs to happen for the good of their own careers. And, and Reese Nelson is in that position. Is 20 million a fair price? I think if you're including the add-ons in that, uh, then I think that that's a good starting point. But I'd also probably accept like 15 million um, in total if I saw as the window was going on that there was no real movement with this and, you know, it wasn't going to happen. Because I think as much as he doesn't seem like a troublemaker, doesn't seem to be kicking the manager's door down and, and demanding that he leaves, he has obviously, according to this report, informed Arsenal that he is interested in moving away. And I think when you keep someone at a football club as, for as long as we have, and you use him as sparingly as we have, and at no point has he caused you any problems. I know everyone says, look, you've got to look after the interests of the club and you should be doing the best business possible. Yeah, of course. But at the same time, I think sometimes it can work the other way around. Sometimes it's not the player owing you. Sometimes it's you owing the player. And I think in Reese Nelson's case, where he's probably been told that he's going to get more game time than he actually did, for that then not to materialise and for him to stick around um, even when it was abundantly clear that he wasn't going to play and be a loyal servant and always be ready to go when we need him. And, and at the very least, you know, as I say, some of the performances when he has got a chance haven't been amazing, but you can never fault him for his, for his effort or energy levels or desire to try and succeed. It's just not really happened for him. So I feel like this is one of those cases where, for example, if he wanted to join, I don't know, let me just throw one of these clubs in there. Let's say that he wanted to join Nottingham Forest. And, and Nottingham Forest said, look, FFP, PSR, all of that nonsense. We can only pay £12 million for you. Do I th think that Arsenal should just go, no, there's no room for the discussion here, no room for negotiation here, and just essentially tank the deal? No, I don't. I think Arsenal would be well within their rights under those circumstances to kind of say, OK, well, look, we're looking for X amount. We're willing to compromise a little bit, um, but that's maybe slightly too much in terms of how far we'll come down. Let's see how the window goes. Let's see if there's any other offers that come in. Um, but also you have to find that balance, right? Because you don't want Forrest to then turn their attention to someone else and Reese Nelson move out, uh, miss out, I beg your pardon, on a move altogether. So it's really, really difficult. But I feel like as a key, the, the general point I was making is that there is a part of me that believes that because we have kept Reese Nelson at the club for so long, because we rejected approaches for him in January and stopped him moving on then, there is a responsibility on our part as a football club to A, yes, do the best for ourselves, but B, to do what's right by the player as well. And I think that this is a really underrated thing when it comes to football clubs and the way that they operate. Everybody always talks about clubs being bad sellers and all of this, and we get that a lot, don't we? I think sometimes, though, you have to you have to sell for lower because it's in the best interest of the player. You're going to move them on anyway, and sometimes you have to find that compromise as a football club. And, you know, if we rejected approaches in January and then said, look, we're going to let you go in the summer, but then make it impossible for him to go in the summer – because we've priced him out of a move, then that's bad on our part. And players talk, agents talk, um, and that can have a negative impact when you go to give people contract extensions, et cetera, et cetera. Are you sure you want to sign here, mate? Because they are notoriously bad at letting people go. They're notoriously bad at facilitating moves, um, despite promising that they will allow certain players to move on. So I think that's a really, really important factor here. But look, I, I think I'd be delighted for Reese if he gets a Premier League move. You know what, looking at Reese's style as well and the fact that he was relatively successful in the Netherlands, if I were him, I'd be open to moves abroad as well. The problem is, is that I don't think Arsenal will get anywhere near that £20 million fee um, in total if they don't sell him to a Premier League club. So if he's going to go abroad, then they definitely need to compromise on the price. I think they might just need to compromise a little bit, though, on that figure anyway. But that's uh, the latest on Reese Nelson. We'll keep a close eye on that and see how it develops, of course, over the course of the summer. Okay, our main story today. It was reported uh, on Friday that Arsenal have inquired about the Everton midfielder Amadou Onana. Uh, this came from a report in the Liverpool Echo from journalist Joe Thomas and has been picked up by a couple of other people who have said that they've uh, 
they've backed this, who have essentially backed the story, backed the claim. Um, Joe Thomas says he understands it would take an offer of at least £50 million for Everton to begin to consider his departure. Now, we know that Everton are in negotiations at the moment with Manchester United for Jared Branthwaite. Um, we know that Manchester United have tried to lowball them. They're not having it. Um, and we know that there's an Everton takeover on the horizon with the owner of AS Roma coming in um, and potentially saving Everton after the 777 deal uh, collapsed. I'll tell you what. If I was an Everton fan, I'd be delighted with that because the 777 deal, although it was something that was necessary because of Mashiri's want to get out of the football club and all the rest of it, it was always going to go badly. Like they've just got a horrendous track record. And so if I were an Everton fan, I'd be glad that fell through. And I'd be glad that someone else has come in and um, and had a look at the club and is willing to move forward in the transaction to try and take it on. They've got a new stadium coming. Um, they're a well-supported football club. It's, a, it's an attractive proposition if the price is right, of course. Is Amadou Anana as attractive a proposition? And is that price of 50 million right? Well, this is purely my opinion and nothing more. OK, we are going to do a scouting report this coming week on Amadou Anana where we're going to look into his strengths, his weaknesses, a bit like we did for Benjamin Sesko. And then I'll give you guys a conclusion of where I'm at on him. With Sesko, I was kind of like 50-50 going into that scouting report. And once I'd done it and assessed all his strengths and weaknesses and really spent a lot of time researching and understanding a little bit more about the player, I kind of changed my stance. And I was more sort of 65% in favour of the move and still had maybe 35% in terms of reservations. When it comes to Amadou Onana, I've got to be honest, I don't think this is the right signing for Arsenal. I don't think this is a sign-in that Arsenal should be looking to do. I certainly don't think that he's worth north of £50 million, which is what this report suggests. I think physically, the guy is an absolute monster. The ground he covers, the strength, the height. Well, these are all things that we know Mikel Arteta is really... Uh, sort of big on as we've seen him build this kind of land of a giant sort of team over the last few years. Yeah, fine. He ticks a lot of those boxes. But on a technical level, I'm sorry, Amadou Anana is nowhere near it. He's not a good enough passer of the ball. I don't think he's intelligent enough in possession. I don't think he is um, somebody that will adapt well to the complexities of our system and of our tactics. Amadou Anana to me, is someone that you kind of just got to let cover as much ground as possible and get up and down the pitch. But is he disciplined enough um, to, you know, be a part of a really complex, well-functioning system? I don't think he is. And look, I, I've spoken about other players. Like we've talked about Martin Zubimendi as a midfield option, for example, in the past. And I've said my worry with him is that physically not quite there, technically brilliant. Well, with Onana, it's the opposite. Physically, I've got no doubts, no questions about whether or not he can do the job in that sense. But in terms of his technical level, I'm just not convinced he's there. We'll do the scouting report. We'll look into him in a lot more detail. And maybe my stance will change. I'm not like one of those people that's pig-headed. I'm open-minded to changing my mind if I see what I need to see when I conduct that research and when we make that breakdown episode. But I just, yeah, right now, that's not a, a deal that excites me. I wasn't massively excited about the idea of, of Douglas Luiz. I know he's signing for Juventus, but that was one that was being touted about a week ago, right? But I'm even less optimistic and less excited about Amadou Anana because I just don't see it. And maybe Everton fans will tell me I'm wrong. Maybe when I do my scouting report, I'll change my view and my stance on this. But for me, this is not a deal that Arsenal should be looking to do this summer. This is not a deal that is worth spending north of £50 million on. And hopefully it doesn't happen. Um, that's that's my stance right now. As I say, it could change, but that's where I'm at today. OK, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for joining me. Uh, apologies for the pre-recorded episode, but it is, of course, uh, Father's Day. So happy Father's Day to everyone celebrating, um, uh, you know, remembering fathers that are no longer with us as well. Grandfathers, too. Uh, big love to everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, I will see you all on the next one tomorrow. Until then, take care of yourselves and have a great day. Goodbye.